But at the White House, the president seemed to reflect the majority view of what's ahead. I know it's hard to understand, but sometimes painful things like this happen. It's all part of the process of exploration and discovery. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. There'll be hearings on Capitol Hill next month as the Congress and the administration take a look at the space program in light of what happened today. They'll examine the timetable, the question of manned versus unmanned flight, among other things. But there seems to be no inclination in the Capitol tonight to give up. The space program will go on, as the president said, bloodied but unbowed. Peter? Sam, we both know that the president has an incredible capacity to comfort the nation at times like this. I thought today he was as eloquent as I'd ever heard him. You tell me from your own perspective why you think this Capitol stopped so suddenly today. Well, it stopped because it was shocked. It's never seen anything like this before. As many people have already said tonight on your broadcast, Peter, it had gone so well. The space program had gone so smoothly. People, uh, except on uh, one outlet, uh, uh, didn't even have the opportunity to watch the space program. The major commercial networks had uh, not uh, carried the uh, launch for a long time. And so when it happened, it was like something that shouldn't have happened occurred. Uh, we're used to terrorism now. When the next word comes that another plane has been hijacked, we're all going to be horrified, but we will have expected that. No one expected this. And, and like human beings everywhere, they just came to a halt. Sam Donaldson, in all the phraseology that has been used about the heroism of the people in space, so far I think it's this line from James Michener in some respects, who said in all of the talk he had with all of the astronauts in the space program and the research for writing his novel, he never talked to them about fear. This also appears to have been one of those incidents which get so indelibly marked in people's imagination that they remember where they were, as so many of us remember where we were on the day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated, where we might not remember where we were on another uh, catastrophic occasion. This was one of those days, and as we said at the beginning of the broadcast, this has affected the nation, all across the nation, in big towns and little towns, cities, villages. Everybody has shared in it, in part because so many of us saw it. Here's ABC's Bill Blakemore. In classrooms around the country today, with someone from the classroom world lifting off, it was as if they all were. What are you feeling? Oh my goodness. What are you feeling? Goosebumps all over. Yeah. James Rowley was a semifinalist in NASA's Teacher in Space selection. We have a report from the Flight Dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. My director confirms that. We are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. Can we, can we get the cameras? Brought in for the New Age's first formal classroom lessons from outer space, our children were suddenly taught instead the old lessons of mortality. Of the real risk which gives any victories their meaning. Well, I was really amazed to see it because I never thought an um, explosion would really ever happen. I was pretty scared because I thought it could have been my science teacher that was going to be hurt in it. A finalist in the teacher selection. It's something that'll take a long time for people to get over, but I really feel that it's worth every effort to continue the space program. Hey, space shuttle explode, get it right now. In the streets and stores across America today, that same feeling in the gut we had known before. Well, I think it's very tragic. I think it's the most tragic thing since the death of Kennedy himself. I got the same sick kind of feeling that I used to get when I was in Vietnam. Just a, just a horrible feeling. The feeling that you get, that cold feeling all over that only happens maybe five times in your lifetime. When... We were all set up for it, watching this shuttle flight especially, because this time the space age was really going to begin. One of us was going, not just a teacher but a mother, a private citizen, your neighbor. That's very upset. After all that about Christy McAuliffe, it's almost as if you know her. Today, in the United States military and scientific communities which built the space program, the professionals tried to handle their losses. And today, it's a very somber, uh, grave-like situation here. The uh, NASA public affairs officer with us was in tears because he had worked with these people. <clears throat> and uh, it is very close, and we're all feeling it. And I, 
they find it very hard to talk about. People are kind of uh, numb, just uh, shocked. One of the first, Chuck Yeager, who conquered the sound barrier. You don't give an awful lot of thought to it because, number one, you can't do anything about it when it happens. And the newest, Purdue University students hoping to join the space effort. Oh, hey, there are risks involved, and being an astronaut is not this little, little dream. It's, uh, it's, it's a job, and it's, it has risks, and there are dangers involved. A memorial flame was lit in the Los Angeles Olympic Stadium. Our national space effort lost innocence. The challengers learned of death. We will travel in space, but now none of us will take it for granted. Peter? Bill, we mentioned earlier the uh, eloquence of the president today, who is so vital to the nation on an occasion like this, as we see in Bill Blakemore's piece, someone who can somehow crystallize the emotion that uh, so much of the nation is feeling. The president reminded us today that on this very date, 390 years ago, the great explorer Sir Francis Drake, the first man to circumnavigate the globe, died when his ship was wrecked off the coast of Panama. An incredible jump in 390 years from circumnavigating the globe to searching for the heavens. There have been a great many words today. It seems that on occasions like this, a lot of the talk seems to act, have a cathartic effect on the nation as a whole. Some final thoughts now, perhaps, from ABC's Lynn Schur, who covers space for us and is in California tonight. Lynn? Peter, I feel as if personally and professionally I have felt the absolute peak and the absolute depth of the American space program this week. The success, of course, of Voyager's trip to Uranus and the horror of Challenger's explosion. John Glenn said with sorrow that perhaps NASA isn't perfect. Well, perhaps if humans are meant to fly in space, perhaps NASA needs to be perfect. On the other hand, uh, maybe that is simply the risk of confronting the future. In any event, the next few weeks, the next few months are going to be critical, not only in terms of America's space program, but in terms of the future of NASA itself. Lynn, thank you very much for your uh, stoic work today. Your mention of John Glenn, I guess, reminds us of the, of the enduring quality that being an astronaut can have, covering John Glenn in the presidential campaign. Um, he doesn't like to hear this, I guess, but it's inevitable. Covering him, I think it was in a supermarket in Iowa, and people not recognizing him as a presidential candidate, as he would like them to do, but people rushing up to him, and in many cases bringing their children to him and saying, we named this child, this boy child, after you, John Glenn, because you were the first man to completely circle the globe. And it stays with him always. Let us remember this is a human tragedy as we think of the seven people on board the Challenger shuttle again today. As you look at them from left to right across the top of your screen, Greg Jarvis, the payload specialist, 41 years old, he had been conducting tests on the effects of weightlessness on fluids. Francis Scobie, or Dick Scobie, the commander, he'd flown jet fighters in Vietnam. Michael Smith, his co-pilot, the shuttle pilot, his first mission on the shuttle. Ronald McNair, mission specialist from MIT, his second shuttle mission. Judith Resnick, one of the two women on board, the concert pianist as well as the engineer. Ellison Onizuka, the Hawaiian, who always took the macadamia nuts down to Cape Canaveral to keep his fellow astronauts happy. And on Teacher's Day, teacher in space, Krista McAuliffe, a woman who was clearly the star of this particular mission and whose very presence on this mission had so engaged a new generation. We invested a large part of our national psyche in the space program it is a catastrophe. It will surely set the program back. But America will stay in space. That's where America belongs. I'm Peter Jennings. Thank you for joining us. I hope you'll stay tuned for Nightline later with Ted Koppel as we and the nation continue to discuss this tragedy that has really befallen the nation. Good night. The Shuttle. Disaster in Space has been a presentation of ABC News.